Pathways of cholesteatoma spread. Cholesteatomas are channeled along characteristic pathways by surrounding mucosal folds, the middle ear ossicles, and their suspensory ligaments. The middle ear can be divided into three compartments, the epitympanum, mesotympanum, and hypotympanum. The epitympanum lies above the level of the lateral process of the malleus, it contains the malleus head, incus body, and their associated ligaments and mucosal folds. The annular ligament sends off fibrous bands from the anterior and posterior tympanic spines that meet at the neck of the malleus tympanomalleus ligaments. Pars flaccida shrapnel's membrane is exempt from the dense fibers that form the middle layer of the pars tensa. The lack of this structural support predisposes shrapnel's membrane to retraction in case of negative pressure in the middle ear. The mesotympanum contains the stapes, long process of the incus, handle of the malleus and the oval and round windows. The eustachian tube exits from the anterior aspect of the mesotympanum. From the mesotympanum, often impossible to visualize directly, two recesses extend posteriorly. Sinus tympani lies between the medial wall of the mesotympanum and the facial nerve and is very difficult to be accessed surgically. The facial recess is bounded by the fossa incutis superiorly and the cordal eminence and corda tympani nerve laterally. Prussic space is located between the tympanic membrane, pars flaccida, and neck of the malleus and the upper boundary of the lateral malleus fold. Posterior pouch of von Trolch lies between the tympanic membrane and the posterior malleus fold. Epitympanic cholesteatomas start in prussic space. Cholesteatomas from prussic space spread via the posterior epitympanum, posterior mesotympanum, and anterior epitympanum, in that order. The most Common is the posterior epitympanic root where the cholesteatoma spreads to the superior incudal space. Lateral to the body of the incus potentially gaining access to the mastoid through the adatus ad antrum. The second most common is the inferior root, through the posterior pouch of von Trolch. This root allows cholesteatoma to gain access to the regions of the stapes, round window, sinus tympani and facial recess. Anterior epitympanic cholesteatomas form anterior to the malleus head. Facial nerve dysfunction may occur with these lesions, which can also gain access to the supratubal recess of the middle ear via the anterior pouch of von Trolch. Microscopically the squamous epithelium of a cholesteatoma develops into a cyst of desquamating squames. This epithelium may rest on granulation tissue or fibrous tissue and sometimes, 6 in 15 cases, a part of the cholesteatoma overgrows normal mucosa. Cholesteatoma has a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium named cholesteatoma matrix. It also presents a connective tissue, containing collagen fibers, fibrocytes and inflammatory cells, named parametrix, which is in most of the cases in contact with squamous or ciliated cylindrical cells, remains from the original middle ear mucosa. Some authors describe the parametrix as the most peripheral portion of the cholesteatoma, comprising granulation tissue or inflammatory subepithelial connective tissue, with lymphocytes histiocytes and neutrophils. The parametrix appears as an inflammatory network that involves the cholesteatoma. Spreckelson stated that the matrix and parametrix, in normal or pathological tissues, are formed by type 4 collagen, tennyson, fibronectin, BFGF and metalloproteinase MMP. In the study conducted the parametrix consisted of granulation tissue or inflamed subepithelial connective tissue. The growth of Cholesteatoma could require angiogenesis in the parametrix connective tissue. Angiogenesis enables and supports the sustained migration of keratinocytes into the middle ear. Cavity. Bony erosion occurs by two principal mechanisms. A pressure effects produce bony remodeling, which occurs regularly throughout the normal skeleton. B. Enzymatic activity at the margin of the cholesteatoma enhances osteoclastic activity, which greatly increases the speed of bone erosion. These osteolytic enzymes appear to increase when a cholesteatoma becomes infected. Dornhofer studied the advisability of reusing the incus for ossicular reconstruction in cases involving cholesteatoma. Their examination showed that a number of specimens apparently free of cholesteatoma after macroscopic examination had microscopic evidence of cholesteatoma. Likewise, microscopic examination of an incus that appeared to be free of residual cholesteatoma revealed epithelial cells deeply invading the bone. Macroscopic examination consistently under estimated the amount of erosion that was clearly evident upon histologic examination. In light of these findings, gross examination of the incus after removal of cholesteatoma is not reliably predictive of invasive 
microscopic disease. Reusing the ossicles in this situation creates the potential of reimplanting the disease. Cholesteatoma epithelium behaves more like a wound healing process than a neoplasm. The available evidence to date does not indicate that cholesteatomas have inherent genetic instability, a critical feature of all malignant lesions. The induction of hyperproliferative cells in all layers of the cholesteatoma epidermis implicates a potential idiopathic response to both internal events as well as external stimuli in the form of cytokines released by infiltrating inflammatory cells. The presence of bacteria may provide a critical link between the cholesteatoma and the host, which prevents the cholesteatoma epithelium from continuing specific differentiation programs and returning to a quiescent state in which it becomes minimally proliferative, non-migratory, and non-invasive. Conclusions. The exact mechanism or pathogenesis of cholesteatoma seems not to be identified, however, neither the aggressiveness of the disease nor the description of its key elements is yet clear. Cholesteatoma appears as a benign lesion, having a dynamic proliferative pattern, with an associated locally destructive potential and entertaining an inflammatory reaction in the parametrics. During its evolution, it will induce a diffuse fibrosis, affecting both the function of the tympanic membrane, and the ossicular chain within the middle ear. In some cases, the size and the aggressive character of the lesion can mimic a malignant process. More than that, the pathological examination of tissue fragments could not always certify the diagnostic elements. The matrix parametrics interface could not be evaluated, thus leading to a false positive diagnosis of malignant tumor. We consider that the first part of the study needs a further immunohistochemical assessment of the squamous differentiation pattern of the matrix, heavy cytokeratin versus light cytokeratin ratio, and also of some epidermal growth factors and nuclear proliferation factors. A further study concerning the assessment of the matrix parametrics interface will be made by evaluating the expression of certain extracellular matrix elements, type 4 collagen, laminin, fibronectin, and the phenotype of certain fibroblastic cells, myofibroblastic differentiation aspects. A basic knowledge of the anatomy of the middle ear provides the fundament for understanding the disease, progression and concepts for surgical management. Anterior epitympanic cholesteatoma may be easily overlooked during tympanomastoidectomy if not explored. The most common location for cholesteatoma persistence after chronic ear surgery is sinus tympani and the facial recess. Sinus tympani may be directly accessed via a posterior approach through the mastoid, posterior tympanotomy or facial recess approach.